already? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm Ed McMullen, and I am teaching the online class for uh, our Sunday school here at Macklin. And uh, we, we want to take the opportunity to welcome those of you that could not be with us today or those of you that will be viewing us um, in the Sunday School lesson at a later time. Uh, we're excited here at Macklin today because we have uh, in-house classes and we have uh, five other classes going on at this time in the different parts of the building and we're encouraging our people to get back to uh, studying God's Word in person and loving on each other. But for those of you that are unable to do that, we want to thank you for, uh, for joining us this morning. And uh, I want to continue sharing some thoughts with you that God's laid on my mind about um, his word being true. Can we trust it? And what does the science say around us? And how does it compare with what we would expect to find from God's word? Let's start with a word of prayer today. And uh, Father, we thank you so much for letting us um, uh, share in your word. Father, I thank you for all of those that have been able to come back today. I pray for those that are watching today that can't come back at this point. Uh, we pray that they will be able to soon. Holy Spirit, I ask you to please be with me this morning as I share from the scriptures and the examples that you've given to me um, so that we can have confidence and know that your word is true and that you do love us even when we're unlovely. You loved us enough to let your son Jesus come and die on the cross, pay the penalty for our sins. Thank you for that. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. This morning, <clears throat> as we begin, I wanted to review just a little bit for those of you that are just uh, joining us. And uh, you'll remember that we've talked in the last two weeks about the fact that God created all things in six days. And when he got through with that, he said it was good. And then when he got through with the last part of it, creating man, he said, it's very good. And we talked about what that would be like. And I hope for, for now you have a picture about what God's world was like. It was perfect. It was a perfect environment. Um, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning of Genesis because he intended them to last forever. You see, that's why he said they were very good. He intended for them to last forever. And so it was through man sinning, and then consequently after that, the sin of the world that led him to have to change the, the original creation. But so in the beginning, we know that things were very good. We know that uh, the plants and animals would have been uh, very large. We talked about that last week. Uh, the plants would have been large, the, the animals would have been large, humans would have lived a long time because they were living in the perfect environment that God had created. And so uh, we also talked last week about the fact that as God created uh, the, the earth and the animals and the plants, we were told that God created the animals after their own kind. Now, as we talk about all of these things, the point that I want to make to you is, as I asked myself back in the 70s, Lord, help me. There ought to be proof of all of this. You see, all the way up through my elementary education and my high school education, and all the way through my college education, <laughs> and all the way through my first eight years or so of teaching ninth grade geography and some other classes in social studies in the high school, I didn't see the evidence. I never, I never saw it. Nobody pointed it out. So I didn't know it existed. And what I'm finding is, here we are in 2020 today, and for the most part, nobody still has ever pointed it out to you. And so one of the things that I want to share with you in these lessons that we've had come up and the ones in the weeks to come, and, and by the way, we've got some really exciting lessons coming. Next week will be uh, a, a real uh, good lesson, uh, not that today's is not, but uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the class today. But uh, we, you know, as, as we look at this, what we want to ask the question is this. Is the Bible a science book? 
Well, I've always heard people say, now look, it's not a science book. It wasn't intended to be a science book. It wasn't intended to be a history book. It was intended for God to be able to speak to us. Well, I'm here to declare to you today, 100%, it is a science book. <laughs> okay, it is a science book. It was intended to be a science book. And the author that wrote that book had no error. <laughs> and so just because it says something that you don't understand, that doesn't make it not true. You see, there are so many things, and we're going to talk about some this morning, that in the past people didn't think that they were true. And as a matter of fact, they thought the Bible was wrong scientifically. But as we've gone through history, there's never been a time when any scientific statement that was ever made in the Bible has ever been proven to be wrong. Okay, That's the assurance that you and I can have. Now, as we... As we talk about uh, the Bible, the one thing that I want to call to your memory is 1 Thessalonians 5.21. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, test all things and hold fast to what is good. As Pastor Mike says all the time, test him. What I'm saying to you is this, Margaret my great researcher and, and assistant, my wife, uh, she has been invaluable in these studies because we have spent the weeks as we've gone along and prepared these lessons, and she's helped me get the slides together. She's helped me do some of the research and all. And one of the things that we've been doing is this. We've been looking up all of the statements that I'm going to make to you because what I want to do is I want to say to you, Test me. Test me. Look it up. If I'm wrong, tell me. But in God's word, God says to us over and over, test me. God says, test all things and hold fast to that that's good. And so as we, as we look at this, you and I know, I was reminded this week of the Bible. B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. <laughs> I stand alone on the Word of God, B-I-B-L-E. That's probably the closest you're ever going to ever hear me get to being in the choir. And, uh, <laughs> but but uh, it, it's the message of the song. <laughs> you know, as, as I used to tell my, my granddaughter uh, when she sang, and, and it was beautiful, but not always. But I said to her, when you sing, Gandhi hears angels sing. And when you and I sing, God hears our heart. He doesn't, he doesn't hear what comes out of our voice. Thank goodness for that. So the, the, the question I want to ask is this. Can you imagine the opportunity that you would have to sit down with some famous inventor and talk to him about the inventions that he'd made? And, and I came across this this week. Can you imagine if you had the opportunity to sit down with Leonardo da Vinci? Now, most of us are very familiar with Leonardo da Vinci. He was one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. Here's some of the things he invented. He invented the parachute. He invented the diving suit. He invented the armored tank. He invented the machine gun. He invented a robotic knight, you know, like King Arthur's knight. And he also invented that fabulous flying machine. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be neat to be able to sit down with him and talk to him and say, how did you come up with that idea? What, what, was, what was going through your mind when you, when you created that? When, when you developed the first flying machine, what was going through your mind? Did you ever anticipate what was coming and all? And so that's what God's word is. It's a sit-down interview with the three that created the earth. It's our opportunity as we read through God's word. It's his opportunity to tell us what he was thinking when he did these things. It gives us an idea about why he did it. He's telling us all of these things. And so, so as, as, we look at, as we look at the things in, that are in the Bible, in the science book, then uh, you and I uh, can know that it's scientifically true. 
I want us to look, very, first of all, this morning at a man by the name of Matthew Morey. And, and you probably have never heard of Matthew Morey before, but he's a man that lived back in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and I think he died in the 70s. But many scientists know exactly who Matthew Morey is. But here's what we know about Matthew Morey. He was raised by a godly mother, and she raised him in the Psalms. And he read the Psalms all the time, and he studied God's Word all the time. And it was later, it was later in life that he became a scientist. And as a scientist, he began to read God's Word. And as he read God's Word, he began to see statements that were made in God's Word. And so as he read those statements, God spoke to him, and he was able to see scientific principles that had never been seen before. Now keep in mind that, he, that he's reading these scriptures in the mid-1800s. Now mid-1800s, because civilizations by that time had been around for about 4,000 years maybe. And so, and so a, a lot of scientists had come, and a lot of them had a lot of ideas. But here are the scriptures that he, that he came to. The first one we want to look at is Job 38, 41. And it, it says, Who provides food for the raven? When its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food. You see, he read that scripture, and he said to himself, God takes care of his own. He created the animals and the birds and the fish, and he takes care of them. And he began to look at the oceans, and he began to see God's provision. I don't know if you have ever been to New England and off the coast of New England. Uh, you can see on the map here, that just off the coast of New England in the northeastern part of the United States, you'll see what is known as the North Atlantic Drift. Now that's the Gulf Stream that comes down from the warm Gulf of Mexico, and it goes up along the coast. Well, you see, they didn't understand about that. But he looked at it and he said, God must be providing for these. Do you know why that's important? Because if you didn't have the North Atlantic Drift going up, the cold Arctic temperatures coming down from the Arctic Ocean, those waters would be much colder than they are today. They're very cold. But because of that, it brings an abundance of seafood up along that Gulf Stream. And because of that, they have an abundance of codfish. They have an abundance of lobsters. And those, those whales that are there, they eat that abundant codfish. You see, because of the warm temperatures coming up, God has provided a mechanism for being able to provide food for all of the, the uh, fish that live in that area. And so he came, he came up with it and he said, somehow God has, has preserved these animals. God has brought these things from the warm waters. He was the first one to realize that the Gulf of Mexico stream goes up and becomes the North Atlantic Drift. And then, in addition to that, uh, in Ecclesiastes 1.6, in Ecclesiastes 1.6, it says, the wind goes toward the south and it turns around to the north. The wind whirls around continually and comes again on its circuit. You see, he read that and he had an image of the wind currents. They didn't know about the wind currents. He was, he was the one that came up with the idea, and he began to observe, and he said, the, the winds ought to go around, because God's word says they go around. They, they should go around. And so he began to monitor that. He was, he was a seaman. And he began to monitor those things. And he began to make notes. And he began to talk to sailors. And he began to get information from them. And gradually he did that. And you and I, you and I know today, when our storms come, where do they come from? from? From Africa. You see it in the Caribbean today. And the winds blow across this way. But you'll also see from this map that 
what happens when it gets to the mid latitudes, when that storm hits the coast of the US, what's gonna happen? It's gonna turn and come back toward Georgia. And then those storms go out to sea and then they go back down and they come around again. The interesting thing is that when you go down to South America and you see that, you see that the winds come uh, near the equator, they come in this direction and then they go back. They, they're in the opposite direction, the northern southern hemisphere. Well, he's the one that came up with that idea. And he came up with it because it says the wind goes toward the south and it turns around to the north. That's exactly, God was describing the, the, the wind cycles. He was describing that. And then in Ecclesiastes 1.7, it says, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. Now, you and I, you and I have read scriptures like this so many times. We, we read these scriptures and we just roll off our tongue and we say, no. But he looked at it and the Holy Spirit gave him the ability to picture what was happening. And so do you know what we have as a result of this? We have what we call the hydrologic cycle. Well, people didn't understand that. But you and I know, if, if you see what happens is that the water in the ocean evaporates and it goes up, and then uh, because of the winds, it moves over the land, and then when, the, when it cools off, then it falls back down as, the, as some form of precipitation. And it flows into the rivers and the underground streams, and then what happens to it? Flows right back out to an ocean, doesn't it? Well, what does the scripture say? All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea's not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. You see, the hydrologic cycle. God was telling us, he was telling us about the hydrologic cycle. This was before anyone even knew what happened. But, but God described it in Ecclesiastes 1.7. And then in, uh, in, in, Ecclesia, in Job 28.25, in Job 28.25, he says, to establish a weight for the wind and apportion the waters by measure. You see, he's the first one to come up with the idea of the barometric pressure, the fact that, that air has weight to it. Now, we know that prior to the flood, the weight was greater than it is today, and we know, we talked about that, that uh, barometric pressure and the increased pressure, what effect it has on healing in the body. We talked about the, using the increased pressure for healing of wounds in the wound centers today. And so uh, he, he looked at that, and he's the very first one to, uh, to come up with this. And then in Psalms 8.8, 8, this was the thing that he's most known for. In Psalm 8.8, 8, it says, The birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. I couldn't have gotten it. <laughs> I couldn't have gotten that. But he read that, and you know what he pictured in his mind? He pictured in his mind there must be rivers running through the seas. There must be rivers running through the seas. So he began to take account again, and he began to take measurements. He began to talk to other sailors, and what he came up with is the ocean currents. He's the one that was the first one to map the ocean currents. You see, God gave him the answer, and then he said, how do I apply? It's got to be true. And it was true. When he got his results together, then he was able to develop this. Now, later on, the sailors being able to sail around the world, this makes all the difference in the world if you know which way the winds are going to blow and you know which way the waters are going to be flowing. You can actually see the boats, when the, when the ships go across the ocean, when they go in the direction that the ocean currents are leading, they go much quicker than at other times. And so, you know, I, we read this about what, what Matthew Maury said. He said, it said, Matthew Maury trembled at the privilege of uncovering the logic of God's own mind in his word. <laughs> when I read that, I, 
I thought about Pastor Mike, <laughs> and, and I get so excited, you know, Pastor Mike, he gets up here, and, and, and God, the Holy Spirit just reveals something to him, and he's teaching, and, and he just gets so excited, and he says, I think I'm just going to have a fit. <laughs> and he has a fit. <laughs> you know? And so that's what Matthew Maury did. He said, I get so excited. And, and in the last couple of years, God has really revealed to Margaret and me some real truths in God's word. And, and I have to tell you that there are times that she and I are talking about some of these truths that we've found, and we just tremble. And sometimes we tear up because we just can't believe that God is sharing these truths with us. Well, so the, the point is this, is that there are scientific principles in God's word. Now, let's look at a couple more. At Isaiah 40, 22. Now, that's the end of Matthew Morey, but we want to look at a couple of other things. Look at Isaiah 40, 22, and it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. And we're going to stop there for right now. But, but you read the scripture, and what does it say? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Well, do you realize that, that this was... Um, written many, many, many years ago uh, in the, into the scriptures in Isaiah. Do you know who is given credit today, what scientist is given credit for being the first one to discover that the earth is round? Pythagoras. It was Pythagoras that they give credit to. Now, you've heard Pythagoras before, but you've never connected him with the circle of the earth. What is Pythagoras most famous for? Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> and that is, and you all remember it from school, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Okay, That's what he's famous for. But he was the first one to be given credit for realizing that the earth was a sphere. Okay. But Isaiah said, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and then, <clears throat> so what we know is that God had given them the answers about the circle of the earth, that it was a sphere way before Pythagoras. The problem was he wasn't looking for the right place for the answers. And many of the scientists are secular scientists. Many of them were Christians and they were godly men. And even though they were Christians and godly men, they didn't always know and believe that the, God's word was the perfect science book. Now, look at Job 26, 7. And in Job 26, 7, it says, He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He hangs the earth on nothing. You see... If you look at a lot of the early mythology, they show pictures of, of, of gods with the earth on their back, or they show pictures of turtles with the earth on their back. They just couldn't imagine what, what the earth was doing in space. They, they couldn't have that concept. But do you see that God told them he hangs the earth on nothing? He told them it's sitting out there in space. I put it there, and there are no strings attached. There's nothing. I put it there. God told them that. And then we look at Isaiah 40, 22. And in Isaiah 40, 22, it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Then look at this. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and he spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He stretches out the heavens. Do you realize that it's only been in recent years that we discovered that the universe is expanding? <laughs> the universe is expanding. Now, we don't know how far, we don't know how long, but we know from the beginning it's been expanding. How do we know that? Well, first of all, God's word says he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Now, so often we read those things and we say, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, know, I don't know what he's talking about there. Well, you know, hey, he's telling you he stretched out the heavens like a curtain. You know what astronomers today have figured out and what Einstein figured out? Einstein figured out in, in, in relativity that the universe is expanding. You know, we're, we're getting ready to go on a trip here in, a, in um, 
in a couple of weeks. Margaret and I are, and we're going to take her mom and Karen with us, and, and we're going to go out to Utah, and we're going to leave here at 3.30 in the afternoon, we're going to get there at 4.30 in the afternoon, okay? <laughs> Four-hour trip, we're going to get there in an hour, okay? Um, and, and so with the universe expanding, it gives us all options that we don't understand. Now, do we understand all about that? No, we don't. We don't understand it. But what we do know is that God told us that the universe is expanding way before the astronomers of today realized that it was expanding. So uh, I, want to, um, I want to turn and look at one more thing this morning uh, while we have time. And um, this one to me is, a, is, is a, another really important concept. We, we come to the idea, we've talked about creation, we talked about the kinds of animals, and I, I told Pastor Mike that I, I hope they don't um, try to run me out of the church, but I'm going to make some statements today that I feel very compelled um, to make. And that is that, unfortunately, when, when I was in coming up through school and all the way through high school and my college training and even some training that I've had since then, they were wrong. They taught me false information. Your kids in school today and your grandkids in school today, at, at the fine schools, and I taught in the schools around here, so I'm not disparaging the schools, but we're teaching kids false information. You see, the question comes up, did man come from an ape? You see, according to scientists today, do you, you understand that your kids are being taught in school that we came from an ape, okay? I go back to the things that, that I said in the beginning. In Genesis 1, 20 and 21, it says that God created the birds and the animals in the sea and on the land after its kind. Then in Genesis 1, 24 through 31, God said he created all of the creatures after their own kind. And then he created man in his own image. And then in Genesis 2, 7, God said that he formed man from the dust of the earth and he breathed the soul in him. We're told that God created man. It didn't say anything about God taking the animals and developing one type from another. Man came from God. <clears throat> we had a picture, I don't know if we can get that one up here or not, uh, of the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Well, we, we looked at this, and, um, you know, this just really spoke to Margaret and me. This was Margaret's idea. She came up with this, and, and I just looked at this, and I just got, it tears me up, because that's what happened. God created man, and then he just breathed into him in life, and, and we're different. We're not an ape, but that's what we're being taught. And so... What I want to look at in the time we have remaining here today is the claims that were made. I went back and I was fortunate enough, you know, when I was in school, I had to buy my textbooks. And, and this was my textbook from my ninth grade ancient and medieval history class, okay? 1959, for those of you who are wondering. And uh, so I, I was there and I went back and I looked in my book. And in my book, it talks about what sort of people were the first human beings. And it says some of them were found around, around Lake Victoria in Africa. Some were found near London, England. And, and there was a jawbone, and not a very human-looking one, remains of the Heidelberg man. And then there was the ape-like Peking man who had learned to use uh, fire and lived perhaps 300,000 years ago. And, and then there were some that were called Cro-Magnon men, and, uh, and so I, I, I studied all those. They're in my notes that I took in those classes, and I learned them. <laughs> and today, when we look at those, and I want us to very briefly look at a couple of those. The Java man was the first one, and in 1892 on the island of Java, 
a, a, a paleontologist found a thigh bone. And then, a, a little bit further away, he found a large skull cap. And then in another spot, he found three teeth. They were all about 50 feet apart. But he found all of these, and he said, this is the missing link. He said, this is the missing link. Well, <clears throat> jumping ahead, uh, in spite of the fact that a leading authority had identified two of the teeth as those of an orangutan and the other one was a human tooth, Java Man has been renamed now. They didn't say they were wrong, but if you'll go back and look in the history books, if you'll go back and look in the newspapers, this is it, Java Man. We found the missing link. We can prove that man came from an ape. And so the Java Man was it. Well, you never read in the paper that they discovered that Java Man was a combination of bones from different animals that existed on that island at that time. And this was really a jawbone of a fully human person. And then the Peking Man. The human fossils were initially attributed uh, by the Canadian anthropologist uh, to the species, I don't want to go into it, uh, and then later in the 1950s, these fossils were included in the, uh, to be uh, walking upright, the Homo erectus. And then it says, for a long time, the idea was held that these species were a direct ancestor of modern humanity. And all the human fossils found in what we call the Far East are, are directly related to them. Now, there have been several recent studies to point out the differences among these fossils are just differences in human characteristics. The DNA proves that they were just, they were humans, but they look different than other humans, okay? And then the Cro-Magnon man, the one that was mentioned in my book, it says that the first people who, uh, who had a skeleton that looked uh, anatomically modern, and uh, they lived in, in Europe, and uh, they found that, uh, that the Cro-Magnon man uh, was actually a modern European man, and it was genetically a human. But again, in my textbook in 1959, it talked about the Cro-Magnon man. This is the missing link. We found it. This is the missing link. And then uh, we, we go to the Neanderthal man. That's one that you're maybe more familiar with than the others, but the Neanderthal man is the one that, that you see that they discovered the bones around 1911 to 1913, and, uh, and, and they, they saw that uh, this, the skeleton of it looked like it was bent. Well, what do they tell us that happened? What they tell us happened was that Apes were walking, and, and they were walking on their knuckles, and, and, and their legs were bent in, and, and they walked, and then after a while, they reached a point where uh, they began to straighten up, and then it walked straighter, and then it walked straighter. And so, hey, this was perfect, because he had, he had the brain that looked like a human, but, but he walked like that. Have you ever seen any humans that do that? Yeah, you see older people, and sometimes I do. That's exactly right. In recent years, they've discovered by doing other tests that are available now on the Neanderthal man that he had arthritis. Yep. And they found that because of a vitamin deficiency in the group of people that lived in that area of Germany, that they all had the same ailments. And so as a result, when you look at their bones, they are human beings. They have the mind of a human. But they walk like this because they've got arthritis and they can't straighten up. A whole group of people had it because it was a vitamin deficiency. We know that. Do you ever remember reading anything in the paper where the headline said, Neanderthal man proven to be man with arthritis? No. 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 But when you saw the headlines uh, before that, no, the headlines were there. And then uh, we come to the Piltdown Man that was found in, uh, in, in England, and they, they found that, and they found the, the skull was called the Piltdown Man, and it was considered a major find. Well, later on, the skull, pap, skull cap was actually fully human, and the lower jaw fragments that they found included, including the teeth, were found to be from an orangutan. 
And, and, but when he found those bones, he said, this is it. They all go together. See, it's part orangutan and it's part human. And the newspapers picked it up and they put it all over the papers and everything. And then it was years later after it had appeared in the textbook, Piltdown Man is the one you're looking at. The Piltdown Man, it was discovered that the jaw had been treated chemically to make it appear to match the skull. It was a hoax. It was done as a hoax totally. And, and yet you never read that the Piltdown Man, the missing link, was, was the one. And then we, we look at uh, the Nebraska Man. In the Nebraska Man, in Nebraska in 1922, Harold Cook found a single molar tooth. Okay, single tooth, molar tooth. And he took it to the paleontologist at that great American Museum of Natural History. And he told him, this is the tooth that belongs to an ape man. And then he went to the illustrators at the London News and he had them draw an artist conception of what this man and his mate must have looked like. He had a tooth, and he had them draw what he thought that person looked like, and they spread it all over the, the, uh, the, the London News. And when they spread it all over the London News, it was published in June of 1922. And I tell you those dates because, test me. Go back and look it up and see if I'm telling the truth. And, and as it was published in 1922, that was, and, and it was a two-page spread, Missing Link, the Nebraska man, we got it, okay? Right after that, the Scopes trial in Tennessee came, the monkey trial between Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan. And you know that the idea was in that trial that they put a science teacher on trial because they passed a law that said you can't teach evolution in the schools. And they had the trial. And the whole intent of the trial was to put fundamentalist Christians on the public display and say to them, you really believe this? You, re you really believe God created all this in six days? <laughs> you, you, where, where did they get their wives if, if, if that happened? You, you, what happened to the dinosaurs? And they, and they asked all the, and they were trying to embarrass them, and they did, and, and they did do that. Now, <laughs> I don't think you ever read the rest of that story about the Nebraska man, but they found that that tooth that he made the drawings from came from an extinct pig. It was a molar tooth from a pig, an extinct pig. Now, you never read in the papers that the Nebraska man was not really a full-fledged, you know, missing link, but he, he was a man that was made from the pig tooth. Now you want to know injury to uh, insult to injury? <laughs> in recent years, because of the ways that in 1972, they found that extinct pig living in Paraguay. <laughs> so so not, only, not only was it the tooth of an animal that they thought was extinct, which was bad enough, but it was one that's not even extinct. It was one that was just living in Nebraska years ago, and now you only find them in Paraguay. And so it was a tooth, but they, but they made it all up. You see, they, they made it all up. And then, uh, as we close out today, <clears throat> the one thing that I want to come to is, wh where are we on the missing link today? Here, here's the final word on the missing link. All through history, the evolutionists have told us that one animal evolved into another, to another, to another, and apes evolved into humans. I'm here today to tell you, 100% certain, they've never found it. They've never found it. They've never found it because it doesn't exist. You see, God told them, you do the animals, you do the next animal, you do, do they look alike? Yeah, they look alike. But they didn't evolve from the other ones. And humans didn't come from apes because if they did, there would be proof of it. Do you know what happens? You know, you would think that after a while they would give up and say, okay, there's really not a missing link. Do you know what they call them today? 
they don't look for the missing link anymore. They call them the last common ancestor, LCA. You'll see that, the last common ancestor. And do you know what the argument is today? Nobody argues anymore, I found the missing link. Okay, they don't, they don't do that anymore because, because they, they know. But you know what the arguments are? The arguments are, hey, you know what? When we find the missing link, this is what it's going to look like. And somebody else will say, you know what? Hey, no, no. When we find the last common ancestor, the missing link, this is what he's going to look like. Oh, no, mine's better than you. Nobody is saying we found the missing link because after all these disasters, but I say to you again, as you look at the textbooks, the ones in the 50s, the ones in the 60s, now let me say, I was taught that in school. I was told to teach that as a school teacher. I, I knew it wasn't right, but they told me it was right. They told me it was right. When, when people tell you something, you have to make a decision about whether they're telling you the truth or not. The Bible tells us that we should test all things. And you and I should not only test what our pastor says in the, from the pulpit, according to God's word, we should also test what our Sunday school teachers tell us, even the online Sunday school teachers that tell us those things, and you should test all those things and make sure that they're true. And you will find that God's Word is a science book, it's a history book, and it's a book that tells us about the future. It tells me that when the judgment day comes one day and I stand before God and he says, Ed, you've screwed up and you're bad, you've sinned. Yes, sir. You're right. Penalty is death. You deserve to die. And his son Jesus says, Dad, he asked me to let my death on the cross that I didn't deserve to die, pay the penalty for his sin. Will you count my, my death for his? And he's going to say, Son, yes, sir. Ed, you're white as snow. That's in God's book. We can believe that. We can take that to the bank. Next week, we're going to look at, <laughs> you're going to love this one. We're going to look at the dinosaurs next week. One of the things that you're told is the dinosaurs died out 60 million years ago. They died out before the humans came. I want to share with you next week undeniable proof that these folks are absolutely wrong. My researcher has done some fantastic research. <laughs> Margaret has put together some, some things that you're not going to believe. So I hope you'll tune in with us next week to, um, to check on that. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for loving us. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truthfulness of it. I thank you for the medium, and I thank you for those that are in the booth that are, have made this possible for us. And, and Father, I, I just thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. I thank you for his speaking to me and through me today. And Father, I pray that your, your Holy Spirit will test everything I say, that it'll be truth. Father, but more than that, I pray that those that are part of your family will hear these things and they'll be reassured that your word is true. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.